wonderful good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome here at the group exhibit Hydrogen Fuel Cells and Batteries here at the Hanover Fairground. Also, I'm welcoming all our online guests. We are live streaming from this fair here in Hanover. So, um, hola, konnichiwa, annyeonghaseyo, ni hao. Welcome, everyone. Um, there's free coffee. It's all on me. There are two lovely ladies walking around and serving you with all these drinks. So you can enjoy our next chat uh, regarding commercial steel hydrogen refueling stations, thinking fuel requirements of full-scale fleets. For that, please welcome with me on stage the CCO of Hydrogenous Technologies, Dr. Cornelius von der Heid. Welcome. Welcome, Mr. Dr. von der Heid. Thank you. Um, so, welcome back on stage. You have been here before. You're now a frequent visitor. And, and you brought something. Uh, I hope it's not the tequila from yesterday's Mexican party. Um, we'll, discuss, we'll be discussing what uh, this is later on. Um, so first of all, I would like to know, what do the genius at Hydrogenius do? So what we do, and please excuse my voice, it was not the tequila yesterday, <laughs> uh, definitely. Um, what we do is chemical hydrogen storage in so-called liquid organic hydrogen carriers. Um, it's basically, those are those, these oils that we use. Uh, we chemically bind hydrogen to an oil so that you can then store and transport hydrogen in an oil in the existing infrastructure of fossil fuels. Okay, um, so uh, hydrogen can be produced on site, it can be compressed, and it can be stored in tanks, or it can be liquefied. And this is what you're doing. Um, what are the advantages of liquefying hydrogen? Yeah, so we're, we're not liquefying hydrogen, so it's not cryogenic hydrogen, but we use a liquid as carrier. So the big advantage is that you can actually use the existing infrastructure of fossil fuels, um, meaning diesel tanks, gasoline tanks, at ambient conditions. Um, the, the storage density is comparable with storage at over 2,000 bar pressure, but and ambient conditions and very safe because the, the liquid is actually not classified as a hazardous good. So it's hardly flammable, it's non-toxic. So, so you just talk about the liquid, but which liquid are you using? The, the chemical name is dibenzyl toluene, that sounds very complex, but it's actually used as a heat transfer fluid today for high temperature processes for the last 30, 40 years. So it's, it's yeah, that one, that one contains hydrogen here, that one does not. There's a slight difference in viscosity and a slight difference in color. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's a standard product in industry. You, you can buy it on the market, so there's no, no secret to that. Um, and we're not, you know, it's not like uh, we, we would earn money with the liquid, we earn money with our systems and the, the technology behind it. So, um, what's the ratio? Um, how much hydrogen on how much um, oil? Uh, how much oil? So, we get 57 kilograms of hydrogen in every cubic meter of the oil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so I want to know more about the process. So, what, what you do is you get pure hydrogen, let's say, from an electrolyzer, and then you add the oil and you get this fluid. How long does this process t process take, and where does it take place? So it's a it's a continuous process. It's a, a question of how long it's actually running the whole time as a continuous process. It's a catalytic. The storage part is a catalytic hydrogenation process, which is a standard process. I've actually I can show you what the system looks like. That's uh, that's what we call a storage box or the the hydrogenation unit. That's actually just being commissioned in the United States at our customer site, United Hydrogen Group. That system that you can see here has a capacity of 100 norm cubic meters per hour, and it fits into a 20-foot container, everything, everything included. So at this plant, you produce the LOHC? Uh, lo loads it, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, so then it's carried um, within any container, let's say to a, a hydrogen refueling station. Um, but then I, I can, can I insert the liquid into a car? No, so we don't go on board. What you, uh, that, what you can see here is the two systems, actually the storage box and the release box in the United States. 
and in the back side, you see those, um, those tanks. Those are three cubic meter tanks that can very easily be um, lifted around with forklifts for that application that was suitable. Each of those tanks can actually store a bit more than 150 kilograms of hydrogen. And then at the refueling station, for example, you release the hydrogen via the dehydrogenation unit, and then you go into the car, the bus, and so on in the, in the standard compressed technology. Um, so with the dehydrogenation, um, uh, what happens? Do you need energy to separate the hydrogen? Yeah, so the, both processes are, are fully reversible. It's a, the hydrogenation is an exothermic process, so that you release hydrogen, and the same amount of heat you need to put in into the, the dehydrogenation process. So you need heat and a catalyst. That's also a safety aspect, of course, because the, even though the liquid is very hardly flammable, it's a hydrocarbon, at some point it burns. But uh, if it burns, it doesn't release hydrogen. So you will not have molecular hydrogen until you have a catalyst and, and, and um, heat. So what I still do not quite understand, why don't we just put an electrolyzer at the hydrogen refueling station and then produce the hydrogen on site and so the, voila. Yeah, there's two main reasons for that. One is footprint, especially when you come to, to larger stations. And the second one is permitting and safety zones and um, safety distance, setback distances and so on. With, depending on the, on the size of the station, Today's stations, especially the ones that we see in, in Germany, are more or less demo stations. They're operated commercially, but they're from a size. They're not, not comparable to a full refueling station as you have it on a, on a motorway or something. When we reach those scales, then we, we've done a calculation that if you take a German mo station at a German motorway, and you would translate the, the gasoline stored there into hydrogen, you would have 68 tons of hydrogen stored on site. So you have a very high capacity, and electrolysis then just needs a lot of, uh, of space. Our systems are significantly more efficient from a footprint perspective. And because the, the liquid is not molecular hydrogen, you don't have those setback distances. You can use underground storage tanks at, uh, at refueling stations and very easily and at very low cost store two, three, five, ten 10 tons of hydrogen on site, which you will need as a buffer also, and as a, as a breathing mechanism um, in a fully commercial um, station. By the way, if you do have any questions, um, Dr. van der Heid will be able to answer all your questions. You can just easily raise your hand and I will bring the microphone down to you. Um, so just to once again say, um, so you get the hydrogen from an electrolyzer, or for, from wherever, and then you make a liquid out of it, and that can be easily transported, and then back at the hydrogen refuel station, you do dehydrogenation, get the hydrogen again, and insert it into a fuel cell powered car. So, thinking of the German energy transition, we already have an existing infrastructure for regular fuel. We already got large tanks transporting fuel. Can these tanks be used? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, exactly. My voice is, is leaving me here. Um, exactly. So that is exactly the, the idea behind it. You can use the existing infrastructure. You can use ships, train transport, trucks. You can use the large oil tanks uh, that you have to store very large amounts of, uh, of hydrogen. And it's very important to understand that the oil is not being consumed. So it's not, we're not producing CO2 or anything with that um, process. Um, it's, it's fully reversible. It's like a, um, yeah, like a bottle that you bring from back and forth. Ah, so the oil can be recycled and used again? Yeah, yeah. So you, the oil just releases the hydrogen and then you, you don't need to process the oil in any manner or anything. You just transport it back and load it with hydrogen again and you can use it again. So it's the, the basic concept. Oh, that's, by the way, that's what a release box looks like. And uh, what you can see on the left-hand side here, those are milk tanks. So that, just as an example, how, how easy you can store those, uh, those large amounts of hydrogen. And that is how the, 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 the circular process uh, works. So we have hydrogen, ideally, of course, green hydrogen from an electrolysis, for example, produced at, at, um, at a wind park or something. And then 
you, you have a circular process. Okay, I see. What I still do not understand is, you, in this cir circle, the hydrogen still needs to come from somewhere. We still need electrolyzers. Yeah, but you need large-scale electrolysis at a central wind park or PV plant or something, so you don't have any different um, electrolysis at the stations, for example, where you would probably have, uh, at some point, problems with the grid. Um, and so on, because the, the electricity connections that you need, if you think about a bus depot with 50 to 100 buses, uh, you would need a very large um, electricity connection for that. And we do need electrolysis, of course, we do need that. I mean, we need to produce hydrogen. So uh, and we then can connect directly to the electrolysis at the wind park and make the distribution and the transport very, very easy. Ah, so this, this is a genius idea to bring the cost down, to have the power plants, and then get the to transport the hydrogen in a liquefied version that is way less hazardous. Yep. So, yep. It's, so it's not classified as a hazardous good, neither according to ADR nor to train transport regulations. You can actually put it on a plane um, without any restrictions. So your technology is targeting more on a large scale market. Yeah. yeah. So ah. that's. Yeah, commercial scale, really commercial and fully rolled out um, refueling stations. Well, as far as I can uh, um, express my observation, is that the hydrogen uh, fuel, fueling infrastructure is not that far yet. Um, there are not that many hydrogen powered cars yet, in, yet on In the Germany. <laughs> in Germany. Or Europe. Um, uh, is your technology also um, applicable for other fields? Yeah, so of course, where, basically the technology is applicable wherever you have hydrogen transport. And industrial hydrogen supply is uh, the, the biggest industrial gas market in the world, mm -hmm. and a large part of that is being transported. Mm -hmm. And there, of course, you can also use our, um, our technology. Mm -hmm. um, you said that the market for hydrogen fueling stations is not that big in Europe. We closed a big deal end of last year with, a, with Broad Ocean Motors out of China. And China, we've just heard it in the presentation before, is a hugely growing market. And there, the numbers um, that, that are in the single projects are, you can always add two zeros to what you do in Germany. So Broad Ocean, for example, has 600 fuel cell buses that they need to refuel, not six. Um, which you would have in a, in a project in Germany. So this, at this year's fair, I hear the term commercialization, industrialization, large-scale production. I hear this very often. And I also, I always, it's always linked to China. Is it that the Chinese market is putting pressure on the hydrogen, on the European hydrogen industry? Um, well, I would rather say they give the, the European hydrogen industry or the manufacturers mm -hmm. a big opportunity because the, the Europeans and the Americans from a technological perspective, from my, at least my opinion, are more advanced. Um, China is, is, is um, catching up very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. But the market is in China. In Europe, we've got initiatives and activities, but it's, there's a lot of different countries in Europe, different, uh, different plans, different roadmaps. In the U.S., we had a change of president, and then it, you know, it really everything stayed in California, and the rest didn't didn't uh, happen, at least not until now. In China, they say, "Well, let's have a five-year plan, let's do it," and then they do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I would say for everybody, all the exhibitors here from um, from Europe and the U.S., China is not a threat; it's a chance. It's a, it's a real opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity. So uh, at this year's fair, what other opportunities are you foreseeing? Well, I, w I would really say that the, the hydrogen mobility, and we've got you know, the, the cars out um, test driving, and whoever ever has driven a hydrogen car knows how, how much fun it is. So I think maybe that mobility application needs the last final push in, in Europe and um, a little bit of uh, yeah, Let, let's do it, and then that, that is the big, big um, thing for everybody here, I would, I would still say. I, I don't think personally that in Europe currently we need 
or there is a market for hydrogen-based energy storage, for example. We complain about the grids or the, the stress on the grids, but the grids are still too, too good. It's a different story in China or on islands, for example, especially in the uh, Southeast Asian uh, regions where you have a lot of islands and a dispersed um, energy system. But in Central Europe, I don't see a market for that yet. Okay, very interesting. Uh, who should come and visit your booth? Everybody. <laughs> that is definitely true. Uh, Dr. Cornelius von der Heide is very knowledgeable, not only about the technology that um, uh, well he favors, but also about the hydrogen technology in general. So I highly recommend to visit him at the booth B76. Also, his colleagues will be there to answer all your questions. Uh, our talk has come to an end already, and um, I'm so sorry for your voice. Well, I hope you feel better. May maybe you did yeah. you drink this or? What? <laughs> well, you, 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 you could, you should just shouldn't. Oh, uh, yeah. it's, it's possible to, to, to Well, it's um, it's not if you drink it and you don't vomit, then nothing happens. But you will, and then it goes into your lungs, and that's the the dangerous part. Okay, I'll I'll definitely don't, don't try. not try. That. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Uh, Thank and you then very you much. can visit him at booth number B76. Over there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, up next, at uh, only a few minute time, and t at 10.40, we'll have a German presentation. We'll hear Guido Bermann, the Staatssekretär im Bundesministerium für Verkehr und Digitale Infrastruktur. Er wird mit Herrn Ulrich Walter über alternative Antriebe sprechen, über die Strategien des Bundesministeriums für Verkehr und Digitale Infrastruktur. Und es wird gleich beginnen in so ein paar Minuten. Also haben Sie gerne noch einen Kaffee. Ich lade Sie alle ein. Tee ist auch in Ordnung. Und da sind zwei nette Damen, die werden Ihnen einfach äh, mit Kaffee und Tee servieren. <lacht>